the first strike in Desert Storm, you'll first you'll plan your mission, and the you'll have it exactly. You'll know exactly what your targets are. You'd likely have good photographs of the target area you're going into. You get an intelligence brief. You'll finish your mission planning, and you'll step to the aircraft to uh, to do your pre-flight. Mm -hmm. uh, Somewhere from the initial point inbound, you'll acquire the target through the various kinds of sensing devices you have on the aircraft and then target it. Uh, fly over the target, release your weapons, and, and track those weapons into the target, and then uh, go th out through any escape uh, route that you'd planned. That the, during that period of time, the, the high-intensity portion of the mission, obviously, is going to be from the time that you uh, cross what we call the forward edge of the battle area. Mm -hmm. And that's actually crossing the border into Iraq in this case. Gary, I've never flown a, a combat mission, uh, but uh, I, as far as the training goes, uh, I can remember in my days in Apollo, uh, we spent thousands of hours in the simulator, and uh, it was very realistic training, and when we got to the actual landing on the moon, it was exactly like the simulator. We do train at very high levels of, of uh, uh, well, let's say interest. And our, when you go out to places like Red Flag and you train in the environment that we, we train in, you have high intensity uh, dogfights. Mm -hmm. You have to fight your way in and fight your way out of the target. So the type of training we do on a day to day basis is real world. Yeah. And so when you get into the combat arena, of course your blood pressure's up and your, yeah. your adrenaline's uh, pumping pretty good, <laughs> but it's not that much different than yeah. it would be in day to day. I can remember in Apollo days, uh, when in the simulator in the training, they wanted to get you so well prepared. We had so many failures uh, and so many malfunctions and so many emergencies going down to the moon. The thing was just sort of hanging together with bailing wire. And when we got to the real flight, uh, none of that happened. It all worked great, and uh, we just went right in and had uh, uh, no problem at all. So it was sort of a piece of cake on the real flight. <laughs> I'm sure with people shooting at you, though, and the real bullets coming at, uh, it sure gets your adrenaline pumping. Uh, different than, uh, than a training exercise. Well, let's just say they, we have these things called Smoky Sams that are just basically bottle rockets we use at the range to simulate uh, surface attack, uh, surface to air missiles. Mm -hmm. And watching a bottle rocket come up is certainly different than watching a Sam come off a rail.
Stealth means uh, non-radar observable. In other words, that we're trying to make this fighter was made to try to make it invisible to the enemy radar. Uh, and that's why the strange shapes. Uh, most of our modern fighter aircraft are, uh, are made with uh, sleek rounded curves to, so it'll go uh, real fast and uh, be highly maneuverable. And yet this has got a bunch of strange angles and uh, wedges and flat plates. Uh, which are uh, all well engineered uh, in a concise design so that it'll be invisible to the enemy radar. If you look at the airplane with those plates, uh, you can see how the radar energy would, would be deflected at an angle away from the radar dish that's putting out the energy so that you don't get the return to the radar dish as we talked about earlier. I, uh, you'd think that that would make it supersonic mm -hmm. with that swept wing yeah. look and everything and it really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sub, as you see, it's a subsonic aircraft, and it's designed for night attack. Uh, so you'll hopefully never see this thing in a, uh, a what as, as us as fighter pilots call a typical dogfight. Uh, the uh, engines and all of the fuel are buried within the uh, main body of the aircraft, and also all the weapon systems, and it can carry all of the latest uh, of the smart weapons, the laser guided bombs, uh, uh, such things as that. Uh, there's probably a pretty good workload, don't you think? It's a single crew, uh, one pilot in this thing with all of these uh, uh, modern bells and whistles that they got in there. What do you think as a fighter pilot? Well, as workload is, is relative to the amount of technology that's in the airplane. And having not flown this airplane, I can't say, but based upon my experience, as the, the workload is offset by technology to some degree. But I can bet as you're coming in toward the target and highlighting your, your target with a laser, uh, with a laser range finder, that you've got your hands full. I think it'd be a dream to fly. Well, that Klingon cloaking device that he uses is, uh, <laughs> you know, is, is really interesting. And Lockheed is where I'd expect it to come from. Yeah. From Skunk Works. They've done a lot of things and built unique airplanes. As a unique airplane, it, it, you're stealing in, meaning that you can that the radar pulses will bounce at angles off of the various plates on the aircraft, so that it's not received by the radar transmitter. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's no picture. It's kind of interesting to me, they've got a flight control system that's completely computer controlled, very much like the other aspects of the aircraft. It was amazing how they were able to keep this uh, airplane out of the public eye for so many years and actually have an operational squadron uh, without anybody knowing about it, but that's the, the whole purpose of stealth, I guess, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we kept it a stealth secret, all right. It yeah. was, uh, I say we, the United States, uh, most of us in the United States, including the United States Air Force, were only, uh, if they were similarly uh, somewhat aware of it, they were only somewhat aware of it. They weren't, never seen one, never knew what it was doing. Well, what I've read, I see the touchdown is about 150 uh, knots, and the drag chute was just basically used to uh, um, to save the brakes on the thing because they've got some uh, very uh, high-tech brakes on it. Charlie, you understand that the F-117 it was actually the first strike aircraft in Desert Storm. I would imagine so. It was designed to a night attack, uh, sneak in uh, invisibly uh, to the enemy radar and then hit these strategic uh, targets like command and control centers and radar sites and stuff like that. You know, I flew in the old days the uh, F-102, the first of the Delta Wing airplanes, and this has a real uh, similar shape uh, of a delta wing, which uh, if you take the fuselage away and just look at the wing, uh, it's sort of like a boomerang. And uh, basically that's what a, a delta wing uh, shape is. The delta wing airplane is the type of airplane I'd like to fly because it, it does those things that you'd like to have it do at very low, uh, at very low speeds. Yeah. And you find yourself in that position once in a while in a dogfight where you'd like to have something that will really turn at slow speed. Uh, but this airplane obviously is not set up for dogfighting. It's done, it's task is to go in at night unobserved and that it does it better than obviously any airplane in the world today.
White Eagle is, of course, taking a major role in, in Desert Storm. It's a tremendous airplane. I've had a chance to fly in the back seat of a uh, uh, F-15B, which is a two-seater air-to-air -air version, uh, Gary. And uh, it's a tremendous airplane. Uh, puts a old guy like me to sleep in a hurry at 9 Gs, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> the one thing it does better than any airplane in the world is to be able to, to look out there and see the other aircraft and master the other aircraft beyond visual range, meaning they can go out and, and track and track more targets and destroy more targets before they get to what we call the merge, yeah. before you get to the end of the dogfight mode of operation. So it's a fine airplane. Yeah, this airplane has a 9G capability, which means you can put nine times the weight of the aircraft uh, uh, in, in, as you maneuver in a dogfight. Uh, that also means your body's experiencing nine times uh, the weight uh, that you uh, normally have down here on Earth, which is 1G. Uh, when I was sitting in the back seat of the uh, uh, F-15B and we were in a simulated dogfight with the uh, F-16s, uh, that G level was really a rapid onset. In a dogfight, the aircraft that can turn the better uh, of the two is the one that's going to win the fight. Right. So if you outturn the other guy, it means you have to put more force on your aircraft to be able to get around and turn behind him mm -hmm. so you can put, bring your weapons to bear on him. We call it the big tennis court because yeah. it's got such a large surface <laughs> area that when it turns, when the aircraft turns and you start in a dogfight with an F-15, what you see is that big slab on the top of, big slab's top of the aircraft mm -hmm. with between these two uh, goalposts or <laughs> type of thing. So it's easy, easy to see the F-15 and identify the F-15 right. as opposed to some of the others. <laughs> I can remember uh, years ago when this aircraft uh, was being produced and the uh, first models were rolling off the assembly line at McDonnell Douglas. Uh, uh, I was uh, up there at the factory and was given a tour uh, and I remember standing above on a platform looking down at this airplane and I couldn't believe for a fighter aircraft the size of this airplane. You know, the wingspan was uh, over 40 feet, the length of it was 60 something feet. Those big twin tails. And the big twin tails and the speed brake on this airplane is up between the tails on the, on the top of the fuselage. And I looked at the speed brake which was deployed and to me it was bigger than the wing of the F-86 that I flew uh, 15 years before that. Uh, it was just uh, a, an impressive airplane. Well, it's got that size of the airplane lets it have a large radar dish, which gives us the, the capability to look far out and see yeah. small targets. It, we had a, when we developed this airplane, we were thinking about cruise missiles, detection, and other sorts of things, and this airplane, therefore, can do a lot of that. It also has the, because of the size of the airplane, allows it to carry a lot of, uh, quite a number of, of weapons, mm -hmm. particularly in the Strike Eagle size. That was one of the advantages that McDonnell Douglas had when they competed for the Strike Eagle. It was a large airplane, therefore it could carry a number, quite a number of weapons.
unlike the F-17, this thing's got a lot of external stores uh, on it, which means the fuel tanks, the missiles, and the armaments all carried outside uh, on, the, on the wings or, in, or underneath the uh, belly of the airplane. Uh, and, of course, it uh, reflects radar pretty well. An airplane like the F-15 is just a tremendous machine. You can, uh, you can do both the long-range uh, fight and also the short-range fight and win in both. Mm -hmm. But it's that type of airplane. And the pilots that fly the F-15 are the highest trained pilots, fighter pilots, uh, to date. Well, the A's and the C's, uh, the uh, single-seaters of this aircraft, of course, being used uh, uh, in the Desert Storm as a uh, combat air patrol cap. They go in and they'll, they'll monitor uh, and just fly and loiter waiting for uh, a chance to shoot down an Iraqi airplane if one of them is dumb enough to, uh, to launch into that environment over there. The F-15 is, is doing more than holding its own. It will dominate yeah. the skies over there as far as air to air. F-16 looking at it, it's beautiful just in the air, it's beautiful on the ground, it's the world's prettiest fighter. It certainly is the, uh, the airplane that, that you strap on rather than fly. Right. It's a, it's a pint sized airplane, it's only half the size of the F, uh, F-15, but carries as many bombs as the F-15. Gary, what do you think uh, the F-16 uh, is doing mission-wise over there these days? We're carrying both the night mission and the day mission. The F-16C models with lantern, low altitude night infrared navigation pods are going in at night, I'm sure, to do the night strike with the precision weapons. The C models and the A models basically bombing the Republican Guard positions, trying to soften up the, uh, the, the ground forces. You can see it pulling here, probably a 9G turn right there. Seems like it can turn on a dime. It can, and it, uh, you can see that it can sustain that 9G turn uh, for quite some time. And it, even accelerate, right, uh, in, a, in a high G turn like that, which is really phenomenal. From this picture, you can see the aircraft in, uh, in its low altitude environment. It's a great low altitude aircraft. You can fly it at 100 feet above the ground at 540 knots feel very stable because of the fly-by-wire flight control system. Mm -hmm. uh, the fly-by-wire system is, was new to the F-16. Uh, it basically has a joystick, like a computer joystick for your uh, video game, that runs, sends electrical signals back to the flight controls through a series of four computers. And it, four computers are, run in parallel on boat mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. basically allow you to fly it. So if three computers say uh, pitch up and the other one says pitch down, it votes it out, right? right? The system votes it out. So it's, it's re as they say in the trade, redundant. Right.
pilots have gone through this uh, very realistic uh, simulated combat training called Red Flag. It's uh, uh, you fight against uh, an aggressor force and you fight against uh, the in the desert scenario. So uh, our training has really been very realistic for what we're seeing over there in Desert Storm now. That's right on. The, the particularly the threats you see a missile coming up here. That's a we call a Smoky Sam. Mm -hmm. That Smoky Sam gives us a simulation, allows us to do the the uh, avoidance and we call puking flares out or uh, mm -hmm. putting flares out of the aircraft to avoid any infrared tracking that might be going. Uh, those are heat, uh, heat, uh, high, uh, high heat flares that we saw flashing out there, and those things uh, are to deflect uh, and confuse a uh, heat seeker missile. That's right? correct. Mm -hmm. And we're looking through the heads-up display here, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. What we have here is a strafing pass, and you can see the gun being pulled and the 20 millimeter shells hitting the target. Now, what we're seeing here is the, the configuration of the radar and the weapon system. You can see from this picture, it can carry up to 12 500-pound bombs. Wow. That delivers those with pinpoint accuracy. Mm-hmm. He's turning inside the circle of the F-4, maintaining a good gun picture the whole time. What you see through the heads-up display is the gun sight. And that little pipper that was on that other target means the bullets would be going right through that other airplane. Now that hands-on dogfight switch allows the airplane to go from an air-to-service mode immediately to an air-to-air -air mode. There's an AIM-120 going off. That's the AMRAM, right? That's correct. That uh, advanced to medium-range air-to-air uh, missile. Now you're back on in the air to, uh, air to mud region, we call it. This is a infrared picture of night activities. Uh, you can see the the vision is not exactly a visual picture, but more one of an infrared picture. Mm -hmm. uh, they're flying through clouds here, and that's a real picture, so they want to be able to see through that, so they'll turn the radar on. Now that's a night picture. That's That's in the dark of night. You can see a tank through that infrared system. Now you see the aircraft in its air-to-surface uh, mode where it's coming in to either do strafing or bombing. In this case, it would be a strafing pass. Uh, the, as you can see, the high maneuverability of the jet uh, at low altitude. As we uh, say in the fighter pilot trade, those kind of uh, turns will roll your socks down That's in right. a hurry.
the General Dynamics F-111. Now, 111's been around for a long time. It was built back in the McNamara era uh, when the, we decided we need to have a multi-purpose, long-range uh, fighter bomber. In the early 60s. That's correct. It's been around that long, and it's been a fine tactical fighter bomber during that period of time. You the f world's first swing-wing fighter. What's, what's the crew? Well, it has a two-place crew, a pilot and a weapon system operator that sits uh, with the pilot on the left side of the thing, and on his right side, side by side, is the uh, weapon systems operator. Uh, the aircraft is, is a multi-purpose uh, airplane. It has lots of different roles that it flies, but it's, it's real. It, the thing it does best is long-range night interdiction. You may recall, we used, uh, when the raid in Libya was held, it was the fighter that did the actual bombing because it had the long-range special weapons capability uh, to be able to take in these, uh, these highly precise weapons over an extremely long uh, distance. Yeah, they flew that airplane nonstop from England, uh, from the bases in England all the way to Libya and returned. A lot of mid-air refuelings, uh, uh, but uh, that was a long mission for those pilots. It's a huge airplane, uh, empty weights, about 50,000 pounds plus, uh, fully loaded, it goes up over 100,000 uh, 100, pounds. Uh, that's bigger than the old B-17s that uh, flew uh, uh, in World War II. This airplane fills that role. It does, a, as far as a tactical fighter bomber, it's, it's been around longer than any other tactical fighter bomber in the inventory, and we don't have anything to replace it. Yeah, like the old uh, B-52 that's still flying, this airplane, there are a lot of these pilots that are younger than the airplanes that are flying. A lot of them, you bet. Uh, it's, it was ahead of its time. Now, it was at one time the idea of, the, of Secretary McNamara that this airplane would be the backbone for the fighter bomber force for all the services. Right. Uh, I can recall back you know, 20, 25 years ago when that was going on that, uh, that there was a decision made because it was such a large aircraft not to put it on board the carriers but basically it's been a remarkable airplane. But if you look at that, it's one of the strangest looking things because if you look at those outboard tanks, they're cocked and not uh, cocked crooked. If you look at this airplane as it's taking off, look yeah, at those outboard tanks. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is as the wings swing, the tanks line up. It, it has the basically the strike package, just a strike package leader. If you're, you're going to have somebody go in and put a lot of heavy iron on someone over a long distance, this is the aircraft you pick. The, uh, here we come in now for the uh, uh, in-flight refueling, we're looking at the bottom of a, the refueling boom of a KC-135 Stratotanker, uh, and this is from the uh, boom operator's position. As we see, uh, the pilot flies in right underneath, uh, and the boom operator hooks her up and uh, fills her up uh, in flight. It's an amazing uh, machine. Here we go, just hooking up right now. Yeah, that's called a, a, a probe type of uh, refueling. And what the pilot just did was flew right up to the boom, mm -hmm. put that boom right in his front, right in front of him, uh, just outside the cockpit, and let the boom operator fly the boom around the cockpit. Also has uh, a remarkably uh, remarkable capability for dash speed. Mm -hmm. It's a supersonic low altitude dash airplane. It's one of the few airplanes we have that can go very very fast at very low altitude. And uh, having tried to intercept one of these airplanes going about Mach 1.5 at 100 feet uh, across the Nevada desert, you better do it right or you won't catch one. Yeah, I imagine you have to start a long way out and way ahead of them to catch them. Why would you want a swing wing on an airplane? Well, that's the that's a good question. If you have the wing straight out, that gives you a, a good cruise configuration. It's the best gas mileage you can get at, at subsonic speeds. But as you go faster, 
it's, it's desired to swing those wings back aerodynamically. That means you have less drag and makes the aircraft maneuver better at high speed. We had the Iraqi oil pumps being taken out by, the, by this aircraft, and the reason for that is it has uh, capability with the special weapons, uh, very highly accurate weapons. It can go in at night and do it without, without being as threatened as it would in the daytime. And those uh, smart bombs, they were guiding them right in uh, through the uh, TV camera. As you can see, he's coming into landing, he's got his wings full out. Full right spots out. the uh, landing light. Now, it, it's got a nice slow approach and, and touchdown, very well controlled. As you can see, and that, that allows the airplane to be flown at, uh, at good slow speed so they can stop it uh, very easily. Gary, here we go with the uh, old F-4, the old workhorse from the Vietnam War, uh, the old Phantom. It was uh, a Navy and an Air, uh, Air Force aircraft, and of course was uh, the fighter that we used uh, predominantly in uh, the Vietnam era. And you got lots of time in this airplane, don't you? I got some time in the C model, you bet. <laughs> the, uh, Tell us about it. Well, what we see here is not really a C model, it's the, uh, the basically a converted E model aircraft, which is a follow-on to the C. That's converted to the wild weasel mission, which is what is going on in Iraq right now. What's the wild weasel? Well, the weasel is is the guys that the rest of the fighter community like to see come around because what they do, they have special sensing equipment to pick up the ground radars, and as radars come up, uh, come up to try to track the other fighters and lock on you to try to fire a missile at you, the weasels pick that up. Then they fire an anti-radiation missile right down into the radar dish that's trying to track you. Mm -hmm. So it's a basic of their mission in Vietnam and even today in Iraq is to suppress the enemy air defenses. The Phantom uh, has a two-place airplane. Uh, it's tandem. Uh, in other words, the two crew is sitting behind uh, one another. The pilot uh, of the aircraft sits in the front seat. Uh, the uh, radar operator, bombardier, WIZO we call it, the weapon system uh, operator, uh, is in the back seat of this airplane. And you can see from the back seat, you really don't have much visibility. 
though he can help you look around a little bit for incoming air-to-air uh, -air threats, uh, primarily his job is the weapon system operation, so he would control the weasel and uh, would also... Uh, if you look on these aircraft that are taxiing out there, there is a, a, a missile on the wing station there. Yeah. It's an anti-radiation missile. Then that's what that guy in the back seat does. He's a system, basically a sensor operator. Mm -hmm. Identifies where those radars are transmitting, locks onto those radars, and delivers a little, uh, you know, hello message yeah. to them, uh, coming right. That, that basically goes right down the radar signal to, and destroys the, the uh, radar antenna. Right. Uh, it's got two engines on it. The uh, J-79, which is an old, uh, an old uh, jet engine. Of course, the airplane's old and. They haven't changed the engine, though they've updated it, so it doesn't make so much smoke. General Electric uh, J7 ni it's a venerable engine, but was a very, very well-built engine. The uh, J79, you could run it from idle to full afterburner and just slam it in there, and it would not even, not even cough to you. Uh, in Desert Storm, uh, we've got a lot of the, what they call the smart weapons, these high-tech weapons, which are either laser-guided or optically guided to the target, and this is a good sequence. Explain what's happening here, Gary. Well, this is an opti optically guided weapon. As you can see, it has in the, in the face, there's a little glass place for an open an open area where they can see with a TV camera out, and that's what you see here. It's, it's not free fall. It's been powered and thrusted, so it has a thruster in the back like a little rocket motor and goes right into its target. It's a, a, tr a huge airplane. I've never flown one uh, in, in an actual flight, but I have been in the simulator of the uh, B-52, and uh, it was some experience for uh, an old fighter pilot to get in that big uh, how'd thing. You, how'd you get your hand out of that? Well, I, I, you're right. It has eight engines uh, in this uh, airplane. They've got a newer version of the, I believe it's the G's and H's, which uh, have the turbofan engines, but the uh, older versions of, of the B-52 which originally started out in the 1950s. So a lot of these airplanes literally are older than the pilots that are flying them. Of course, we're using them for carpet bombing, uh, saturation bombing from high altitude. Uh, they've got a, a complement of crew, weapon system, operators, a pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, and all of those are on board. Uh, they're flying uh, with uh, an internal bomb load uh, the, the bombs on the B-52 are carried in the internal bomb bays, but the, uh, it can also carry air launch cruise missiles, which are underneath the, the wings. Uh, I don't think we've used it in that mode at Desert Storm yet, but it uh, certainly is doing the uh, carpet bombing and the softening up the supply lines and the petroleum storage, the fuel storage, the ammunition storage, and everything that's associated with a ground army.
this is a tremendous uh, uh, airplane. You can imagine it's intercontinental. It was designed for strategic bombing, and it was uh, has extremely long range, but it, it still has an air-to-air refueling capability. Charlie, what do you what can you do to compare the difference between the F-111 and the B-52 as far as their types of missions that they would be used for in Iraq? Well, uh, the the F-111, of course, uh, probably comes in low altitude, high speed, uh, and makes sort of a dash in and uh, to a very strategic target with its smart uh, weapons, fires. Uh, for instance, on a, the oil field pumping station or the communications facility for the, the uh, Iraqi uh, command uh, and control structure. Whereas the B-52's been used primarily for the carpet bombing. In other words, they come over straight and level at a sort of a medium speed, high altitude. The, they pick up uh, their target, which might be a, a fuel storage uh, dump or a ammunition storage or a troop concentration and they just start laying down a string of bombs. Gary, we've seen some exciting footage in this uh, last 45 minutes. Uh, we've seen uh, the newest airplanes in our inventory, and we've seen some of the oldest uh, airplanes in our inventory. Uh, and yet every one of them are doing a bang-up uh, job over there. Uh, it's just been fantastic of the successes uh, that we have seen. Uh, and uh, I just want to give uh, all of the guys and gals over there, uh, a big attaboy for, for what we, the job they're doing for us in Desert Storm. Well, you know, it's unfortunate that it's needed, but our, quite frankly, our folks are doing a marvelous job. It takes training, it takes good equipment, and it takes planning for something of this nature to be successful. And it takes extremely proud people flying those airplanes and maintaining those yeah. airplanes to make that happen. So I, I'll take my hat off to them, too. They're doing a fine job. It's the kind of thing that, that many of us really w want to say that, uh, that I'd like to be there to be shaking each one of them's hand. Yeah. 
a big uh, salute to all of the pilots, uh, all of the crews, all the maintenance people in Desert Storm.